Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bartłomiej Bożyszkowski, and together with Michał Bień, we would like to introduce our research about artificial intelligence at CERN. However, at first, I would like to state several questions to consider. Let's, uh, let's ask at first, what is the universe? Or rather, what is the universe made of? Let's ask, where are we going as a humanity? Why are we going there, and how do we want to reach the goal? Well, we work at the European Organization for Nuclear Research to answer these deep questions. This is the biggest particle physics laboratory in the world, which is located on the border between Switzerland and France. Uh, in the picture, we see its most characteristic building named the globe. So at CERN, we accelerate elementary particles to the speed almost as huge as the speed of light using the LHC. The Large Hadron Collider consists of 27 kilometers long ring, which is placed 150 meters under the ground. This is a very demanding experiment, also because collisions of particles take place every 25 nanoseconds. We register them and observe using four main detectors. Two of them are general purpose detectors, such as CMS, which I represent, and ATLAS, which is the biggest detector in terms of size. They are supported by ALICE, which aims mostly to investigate heavy ions, and LHCB, which is focused on research about the beauty particle. CERN was founded in, 1955, uh, in 1954, and since this time, 10 Nobel Prizes were given to scientists uh, who were connected with its research. For now, it employs over 2,600 permanent staff members, and this is a part of big collaboration between 23 member states, including Poland, but also other observatory countries and participants. Main focus on experimental explanation of the standard model led to the discovery of Higgs boson uh, in 2012. It is worth, worth mentioning, as well as the fact that CERN is an actual birthplace of the World Wide Web, which was invented there in 1989 and is an origin of the current internet. So the interests of uh, these organizations are not only in physics, but also in IT development. For this purpose, a very strong department named OpenLab was founded. This is a collaboration between leading ICT companies and researchers in order to apply cutting edge technologies in high energy physics. With Michał, we had an opportunity to participate in the program organized by OpenLab, and today we would like to share uh, the outcome of our projects. Here I would like to mention that uh, the LHC generates almost 50 petabytes of data each year, and this number is going to be increased by a factor of 10 during an ongoing high luminosity Large Hadron Collider upgrade, which is scheduled to start in 2026 according to the activity plot as presented in the chart. So the question is, how could we even process that enormous amount of data? Well, the answer is very simple. Let's apply artificial intelligence. Right now, we will present our separate projects in order to do this. Thank you, Bartek. Uh, during my two months at CERN, I worked on the project Big Data Analysis and Machine Learning in the Cloud that was uh, organized by IT da Databases Group and founded by Oracle. Let's see how we can use cloud resources to accelerate machine learning and big data analysis at CERN. Currently, CERN owns its own data center, the super computing center that runs the private cloud, OpenStack. With OpenStack platform, CERN physicians are uh, up to uh, generate uh, the clusters and make all, all kinds of uh, calculations they want. However, with the amount of resources and needs that CERN uh, uses for its experiments, it quickly becomes infeasible to just buy more computers and more disks. And in IT DB groups, we managed to run public cloud to support this. As a proof of concept uh, use, use case, we used the particle classifier. The, work, the machine learning workload created by Nguyen and all at uh, 2018. This workload uh, is a machine learning classifier that uh, uh, has an input of raw CMS detector data and can an analyze which particle was detected. The W plus boson, which is pretty common to detect, the quantum chromodynamic jet, which is kind of a noise for this uh, kind of classification, and top quark, anti-quark pair, 
which is very interesting for uh, scientists because it uh, happens very, uh, very, it's very uncommon to register. The model was uh, quite straightforward. Uh, it, uh, it was taking two inputs, uh, and uh, the first one was the actual raw data that was registered by the uh, experiment. Uh, each uh, of these inputs had uh, 19 features, and there were 801 experiments that were uh, collected. Uh, this data was passed through the GRU cells, and resulted in 50, uh, in 50 inputs for the, for the further layer. This input was concatenated to the high-level features, which were uh, literally adding the domain knowledge about the, mo the model. <coughs> and these both inputs uh, concatenated were passed to the single dense layer that resulted in the softmax classifier output. And you may say that this is quite a straightforward model and not, nothing interesting in the current world of the transformers and uh, deep learning. But imagine that we are faced by 4.5 terabyte of uh, generated da data that we had to pass to this model. Uh, the model was also expected to train quickly and provide over 95% accuracy. That was a moment where we uh, left the world of the machine learning as it is, and we started to seek the solutions in the big, uh, big data world. So we created a dat data pipeline and found four key points on the, uh, on the data pipeline. The first one, data injection. Uh, w w it was important to find uh, some kind of storage that will be fast, scalable, and reliable for such an experiment. Uh, here we tested HDFS uh, in CERN and Oracle object, object storage uh, in Oracle Cloud. When the data was here, we made a feature preparation using uh, Apache Spark clusters, both in the shape of Hadoop Yarn, which is kind of a proprietary Hadoop cluster running Spark, and the Kubernetes. Uh, this, uh, this Spark solution was used to do such a things as data filtering and one hot encoding. And when the data was ready, we trained the model. We used two approaches for this workflow. Big DL, which is an Intel approach for uh, uh, big data machine learning, uh, is very good for, uh, for us because it was integrated with Apache Spark, so you were just able to use the Apache Spark uh, cluster to run it. It also integrates with Keras API via Analytics Zoo, which is kind of a wrapper layer for uh, Big DL. And when I say it integrates, uh, it was possible to literally copy and paste the uh, Keras model running in TensorFlow locally uh, into a PySpark uh, notebook and run it, and Big DL takes care of all of the parallelization and, uh, uh, and training tasks. So it was very, very good, but had one major drawback. Uh, it didn't train on GPUs. It was a CPU-only uh, framework. So we also train on TensorFlow, which is, I think, much more familiar for you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it was uh, as good as BigDL, but we had to develop the platform to run it in cloud. Long story short, we wanted to run TensorFlow in Kubernetes, but it was no uh, major solution for this. Currently, there's Kubeflow, but there's really nothing else, so we developed it on our own. So if you, if you need fast, straightforward solution for machine learning in the cloud with TensorFlow, there is a certain DBTF spawner. It's very, really very simple, and you can use it as you want. You can also mail Ricardo, <laughs> which is a my main developer. Uh, OK, so this was, these were all the problems that we faced. Now straight to the results. All the tests that we, all the final tests that we made, were uh, processed in the Oracle Cloud. All the computations were made there, and uh, all the uh, data was stored there. As you can see on the top left graph, 
the big DL training outperformed TensorFlow, but only if you don't count the data processing time, the data loading time, because the uh, the cluster needed to load all the data beforehand it started training. Whereas the TensorFlow was training, uh, uh, was gathering the data online. On the top left, uh, on the bottom left chart, you can see the uh, the uh, loss function as it converges, and it was quite a surprising that the convergence was very slow for big DL. Uh, it was not very performant for this workload. Uh, so we asked the big DL team what, what is a point, and they suspected the the bug. So uh, so currently they are <laughs> investigating the issue. Uh, we also trained our GPU, and. Uh, to be honest, we are surprised that using uh, CPUs for this uh, workload was not so bad, actually. We, we believe that GPUs are the future, that they are the only feasible uh, option for the big, da uh, big, da big data deep learning. But one GPU was equal to about 50 cores of Intel Broadwell. So you can say that uh, uh, it's possible for the data centers that are highly reliable on the CPUs to train on them, and they don't really have a need to buy the accelerators. Uh, to sum up this, during this project, we run the dis distributed pipelines in the clouds. We made the pipelines of data that were beforehand were local into a distributed parallel ones. We run the Spark feature preparation in the cloud and manage to use public cloud infrastructure to help uh, CERN experiments uh, deliver more accuracy. Thank you for your uh, attention, and now let's go straight to the Bartex project. Thank you. Uh, the project of Michał was really interesting. However, I will talk about something very different, but I, I hope not less passionating. I will present the project about neuromorphic computing with main focus on its applications in high energy physics. So as we know, in recent years, we were able to achieve spectacular successes of artificial intelligence, mainly thanks to the use of deep neural networks. We applied this technology in different um, industries and in different domains. However, currently used models have their limitations, uh, also because they have only marginal similarity between the brain-like computation. For example, their neurons operate on a common clock cycle, what is also visible in their structure. While our style of thinking is very different because our thoughts are rather continuous. Here come spiking neural networks, which present a totally different approach because they are inspired by the computation uh, in biology, by processing of information in biology, so by real neurons. Their data is encoded by so-called spike trains, and this is basically a number of neurons over time, which is crucial here. So spiking networks can be characterized by a very low power consumption, fast inference, and an even driven processing, especially in the connection with dedicated um, sensors and processors. So to outline the key differences, for sure it's a time dependency because each neuron in a spiking model has its membrane potential. This is a continuous signal over time, and when a specific threshold of the signal is achieved, it starts to spike, meaning it's basically activated. Uh, it is also worth to outline asynchronous output of this uh, type of networks. So basically we don't have to process the whole model to get a result, which is also much faster than using conventional uh, machine learning. In terms of training, uh, we have two different possibilities, however the process is in general much more complex. We can either perform a direct training with spiking neurons, however our output function is not differentiable. It is rather a binary signal which can be zero or one, and hence we cannot calculate the gradient here and minimize the loss function as uh, known from uh, conventional machine learning. We can maybe approximate this function to make it differentiable and then use a set of training rules uh, falling under the umbrella term STDP, uh, spike timing dependent plasticity, where we basically adjust the strengths between uh, the connections of neurons. 
However, the other approach is a conversion from deep neural network, where we basically train an artificial network and freeze its weights and then map them to spiking neurons. Uh, it also has some limitations because it's not that efficient, but that's a pretty straightforward way how to use neuromorphic computing. In my project, I worked on the Loihi chip, which is a dedicated neuromorphic hardware presented by Intel Labs in 2018. It supports both training and inference of spiking neural networks in a very efficient asynchronous manner. Uh, so basically with this chip, we want to mimic the work of our brains in the hardware. I would like to present two benchmarks on the chip where we see that spiking networks are very scalable because their speed of inference does not dramatically change even though the number of neurons in a topology increases. This is also their advantage over classical networks. In the second benchmark, we see that um, the speed, uh, that's, uh, sorry, that's the benchmark uh, about comparison of power consumption between different types of hardware. So here we see that Loihi consumes more than 100 times less energy than the GPUs and over 20 times less than CPUs on the same task. Um, this is impressive. However, I would like to focus on the results of my project and talk more about utilization of this technology at CERN. So as I said at the beginning, current work on high luminosity upgrade is in progress. We plan to generate 10 times more data from the LHC. Uh, spiking networks um, can be a perfect candidate here to, for example, solve a signal to noise discrimination problem and classify particles basing on their records. Because we have enormous data and there is a need to process it somehow, to filter it. So spiking networks could be um, a good way to be applied in triggering system of the upgraded detectors. Uh, as a proof of concept, I was able to solve a MNIST problem of handwritten digits, achieving 2% of error, uh, what was also deployed in the neuromorphic chip with NANGO framework. Here we see an output uh, of neurons and increasing activity uh, determines whether the digit, digit is uh, classified. However, the main goal of my project was solving a jet tagging task at CMS experiment. Uh, in this problem, we classify five types of particles basing on 16 uh, different features as an input from the detector. Currently used models achieve around 75% uh, of accuracy using artificial uh, networks. And with spiking networks, I achieved around 70% of accuracy, what was proved both in simulation, where I converted the model using SNN toolbox, um, and in the regular hardware deployment, where, where I developed a model using Nengo framework and deployed it uh, in the Loihi chip. This was inspired by a simple artificial neural network with uh, three densely connected hidden layers. And we see that results in terms of accuracy are comparable. Uh, so this is already impressive. However, we have to remember about different advantages that we have, such as uh, speed of inference and um, um, efficient um, mm, power savings, enormous power savings. Uh, so this is a very good uh, mm, candidate, for example, for applications where the speed of inference is even more important when a satisfactory level of accuracy is uh, guaranteed. Uh, so for now, as further steps of the project, I play with anomaly detection in time series. Uh, here we analyze gravitational waves from experiments such as LIGO and Virgo. Uh, basically, we try to classify glitches from the detector noise uh, and uh, solve the problem of signal-to-noise uh, uh, discrimination. There is a lot of future opportunities uh, of this technology, not only in the triggering system of CERN, but also in every place with event-based sensors. Uh, and as I said, right now we play with anomaly detection and also explore uh, spiking autoencoders. But uh, opportunities I, are not limited, and I wish I had a little bit more time to elaborate about this uh, in details. The summer at CERN is not only about the brightest minds working on the cutting edge technologies to change the world. It's also the opportunity for over 600 students to gather each year to work on their projects and to get to know each other. During our time in CERN, we managed to do a lot of hikes, climbing, uh, have uh, have discovered all the Geneva area, uh, attended the uh, dedicated lecture program, uh, the hackathons, 
And what is the most important, we made a lot of connections for, with the inspiring people from all over the world. So if you feel bad at this dark November time and want to do something exciting next uh, year at summer, the CERN is currently open for applications for summer student programs if, for, uh, for next year. Uh, there are three student programs that you can attend. The first one, the original summer student program, is dedicated to all the STEM students from the member states. The good thing about this program is that it's uh, uh, financed by the, uh, by the countries that are member states, so literally each country has the quota. Uh, you don't have to fight with all the students from all around the world, but th there is selection only uh, between the students from Poland. Uh, this uh, this uh, program has three months and accumulates, uh, accumulates around 300 students. Uh, by this way, this is very different from our program, the Open Lab, where only f around 40 students are selected from all over the world. Uh, the program is also fin financed by the uh, companies who attend to, uh, who are partners of Open Lab, not the member states. Uh, there's also the third program, Technical Student Program, which allows you to sp spend up to one year in CERN uh, during your studies, working on the project that is in, in line with your, st uh, your studies. So the deadline is uh, 31st of January 2020. If you are not convinced about what we just presented, there is also a CERN Virtual Recruitment Fair. Uh, there they will present both the uh, summer, uh, summer student opportunities or, and the professional opportunities in CERN. So if you are not longer a student, you can also attend. More information you will find in careers.cern. And now we would like to share much more experience with you, with you but we don't have literally more time, so uh, where you find much more information in our slides. You can ask us the questions uh, after this lecture or during all the conference. And we would say a huge thank you to our supervisors in CERN, all the CERN Open Lab team and Emmeline Pell organizers for letting us present this uh, uh, adventure to you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.